uh, today's study. I think it's going. Ah, the light is not on. Yes, it is. Well, this is Pastor Larson. I want to uh, put the the share screen away for a moment, and uh, and put everybody over there on the right side, and begin. All right. Would you like to do that? Where's my clicker? Good morning. This is Pastor Larson, Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach, Florida. This is our Bible study. It is recorded on Saturday for broadcast on Sunday, but that's irrelevant to you. We don't know when you might be joining this Bible study. We hope you enjoy our study. It is the Lord loves to hear us pray, and that's what we're doing this morning. Last time we looked at the Gospels for examples of those who had prayed, and this time we're going further into the New Testament for the prayers of those who sought the Lord in prayer for those situations are th that Luke, the apostle, recorded in the book of Acts, which challenged those believers to seek the Lord for his guidance and for his healing. Now let's get started for the prayers that are recorded in the book of Acts. I hope you enjoy this part of our study I uh, have been reading the book of Acts recently, and I was startled to find out how much praying went on. You know, Luke has a, a very uh, strong emphasis in his gospel and in the book of Acts, which he also wrote, uh, for women. They pr are prominent um, in those books, but also is his interest in prayer. Because he is a physician, you can imagine that he would have prayed for the people for whom he ministered as, as a physician. physician. Uh, so in each of our studies, about a dozen of them, we want to ask and answer these three questions. Uh, the three questions are, um, who was praying? Sometimes it's obvious, and other times we have to look in the context. The second question is, who was praying? I mean, what did they pray? And the third question, what was the result? If, if that result is recorded, it's not always there. All right? The first one is in Acts 1, uh, chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 24. I'm going to read it. Okay. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, Show which one of these two you have chosen. And you will remember that a week or two ago, we looked at Matthias, who was chosen to replace Judas, who went and hanged himself after he realized in his great remorse what he had done, betraying Jesus into the hand of his enemies. You know how that turned out. Yeah. You, Lord, know the hearts of all. So they put forward two, and they cast lots, and Matthias was chosen. But remember, they prayed and asked the Lord to answer that prayer. You choose, not us. Now, I would like a reader for Acts 2, 42 to 47. Very familiar words, I believe, for some of you. Can I call upon Judy as our first reader? Okay. Acts uh, 2, 42 to 47. And they themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayers. And uh, always came, I'm, I'm, some of my words are cut away by the pictures here. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. And, uh, and always awe. came, upon, and awe, awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the uh, apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as, as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their numbers day by day those who were being saved. Thank you, Judy. There is a word or two missing here. 
and they devoted themselves and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching i don't know how that dropped out day by day they were doing these things what were they doing they were attending helping to the others. Yeah. pardon helping others they were helping others that's one of the great things for people of faith who give what they have to those who do not have this is the lord's plan for us mm. okay they were they were um they were uh, worshiping together also and breaking bread and and praying also for um you know i'm sure different different things just like we just prayed for um as they were doing those things that's right they were praying for people but also for the ministry of the word which the, the lord had had given to them but who's this they uh the apostles. All the believers. It's the apostles, but also the believers. There were 120 of them at that time, and they gathered together in worship. And they were doing these things. Um, I've put them in bullet points so that we can separate them out in terms of the verbs, the action things that they were doing. When you devote yourself to the apostles' teaching, they were studying what the apostles were teaching them. And that was a devotion, not, not what you do for five minutes in the morning. This was their constant activity because the early believers did not know everything. Maybe you get the impression when you read the New Testament that the other, other early believers had the Bible already packed away in, in their minds and hearts. But well, the, the uh, go ahead. One of the Interrupt things, any. Um, which we didn't mention, and and I think is is actually harder to in these. Well, who knows how hard it is? Um, selling all their possessions and then distributing the the proceeds. I mean, that's a big thing. Yes, I think that surprises some people uh, that they did not count anything as belonging. To themselves but had everything in common mm -hmm. there were some very poor people evidently amongst them and some who were of means and those who had means gave to those who did not according to their need i want to give you a rule of interpretation and i don't want to take away from this giving nature of these early believers I learned it a long time ago. The book of Acts is filled with examples. There aren't a lot of laws in the book of Acts. There are some. There is a lot of gospel, a lot of gospel proclamation. But rules on how to be the church are given to us by example. Now, here's the rule that has helped me interpret the book of Acts in a less than legalistic way. Please understand what I'm going to explain to you, and I'm, I may do it again as we go through. An is does not constitute a requirement or a law. Do you understand? When something is reported as having happened, it does not require every believer in every age to do what was done in those 28 chapters. It might be a very, very good example to copy, but it's not something you would write down in a rule book for the church of any century and say, we have to do those things because that's what the apostles did. Now, the Lord has commanded prayer, and they did pray, and so our, our requirement to pray comes from the Lord, not from the examples. But the examples we are studying in the book of Acts are those things which inspire us and, and encourage us and teach us that God is listening to our prayers and he answers, sometimes in many dramatic ways. You get the rule? An is does not mean an ought. Questions, comments on that? Mm -hmm. 
Ever hear that before? No. No, that's nice to know. They devoted themselves, it, it gives you a lot of freedom. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, this sentence does not make that a requirement. What makes it a requirement is that the apostles have the authority of the Lord. And when they teach something, it's, it's, it's laid down as, as something coming from God through them. When they devoted themselves to the fellowship, that is our bring, bringing ourselves together in worship. The breaking of bread is the, is the phrase that Luke uses a few times for um, Holy Communion. Correct. Prayers, I think we need no comment. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. Now, they had all things in common. Are we to have glad and generous hearts? Oh, yes. That comes from the Lord. I haven't sold all my property yet. I don't want to be frivolous about it, but I want you to understand that an is does not make an ought. All right. But praising God? All right. So you look at my summary in the bullet points we should be devoting ourselves to the apostles' teaching for the reason I mentioned, and fellowship, and the breaking of bread and prayers. I haven't done any signs. They were done through the apostles who were given special gifts of the Holy Spirit to do those things, to demonstrate that they were carrying the authority of God himself. They were worshiping in the temple together, breaking bread in their homes. Some people say this is they were eating, and I'm not sure why Luke would report that unless they were having Holy Communion in their house churches, which were established very early in the New Testament era. So I don't have a final word on that. Praising God, having favor with all the people. The fact that they were loving other each other and loving others uh, meant that uh, they were uh, having in favor with people. So we were asking the three questions, who was praying? Uh, what were they praying? And now the result, look at this beautiful result. He added to their numbers when they were being saved. That's the, that's the Lord's final, final purpose in everything is to bring people into fellowship with himself through the preaching of Jesus Christ as the one who died for the sins of the world and rose again and is now reigning in heaven. Well, he is also everywhere. There's a lot in Acts 2. You could, you could study that for a month. So let's go on to Acts 4. Uh, who's going to volunteer to read Acts 4? 23 to 31. There's two pages, this okay. one and this one. I will. Um, Acts 4, 23 to 31. When they, Peter and John, were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who thought the mouth of our father, who threw the, who threw the mouth of our father, David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Go on further. Ooh. Go on. For, for truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grants to your servants to continue to speak your word 
with all boldness. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Uh, Acts, I don't see the end of it, but 23. That's, 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 that is the end of it, yes. I don't have the reference. Yeah. <clears throat> Just at the beginning. Well, th this is quite a reading. Um, yes. Peter and John had just healed the man who was at that pool and was lame from birth. And they also explained who they were and who had sent them, that is the Lord Jesus. And they had given a speech and they were arrested for causing a commotion because they were enemies of, of what uh, they were preaching in that city of Jerusalem. So that's the, uh, that's the preamble uh, which goes before the, this reading. Yeah. So as soon as they were released, they went to their friends and they said, here's what happened to us. Yeah. Okay, so here's what happens. They prayed a parts of Psalm two. You see this back here? Why do the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves together and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. Wow. Most of the quotes in the New Testament seem to come, okay. I don't know, I say most, yes, I think it's most, seem to come from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. So the words don't match for that reason and also for the fact that it then gets converted into the English language for us. But you see the similarity. Why do the Gentiles, in some translations, it's the nations, ta ethne. It's the people who are not Jews. As you have heard me say before, I believe that the whole world, according to most of the New Testament, is recorded, is divided, I'm sorry, divided into two parts, uh, Jews and non-Jews. There are many ways to divide the peoples of the world, and that's one way. And that's the way much of the Bible divides uh, the peoples of the world. For identification, not, not for prejudice, certainly not. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves together and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. So you see the same thing here. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. That has happened in every age. That the unbelievers of the world, when they feel threatened, uh, when they feel excluded, when they feel annoyed by the preaching of Jesus Christ, They oppose it. They oppose the preaching. They oppose everything they can. I am not making an application, but I could. I was going to say, we, we see that. How do we, uh, nothing new under the sun, as Solomon said, we see that uh, happen generation after generation. And you shouldn't be afraid of it. You should, you should know it exists and, and know that the Lord knows how it all is going to come out. If you read the Psalms, you find the similar, the similar theme uh, between the believer who is praying and his enemies who have rejected God and his counsel. So this is what the, the enemies of the Lord say. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. <clears throat> and then <laughs> I love to read verse four. He who sits in the heaven laughs. <laughs> not a, it's not a funny laugh like that was a joke. It's a, a laugh of derision. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, 
As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And you know, when you read the New Testament, to replace Zion with the church, the assembly, the assembly of all true believers, the invisible church. Zion is no longer a mountain in Israel. Yes, I guess there's physically a, a mountain there called Zion. But Zion is a projection of, of the Old Testament into the New, meaning the church. So Jesus is the head of the church, right? According to Ephesians 5 and other places. So Jesus, as the head of the church, rules in the church. God has, the God, the Lord, the Father has set his king, Jesus, on Zion, his holy hill. And then I skipped ahead to what happens at the end of all time when the Lord says to my Lord, that is, the Father says to the Son, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. It's pretty strong language for what happens at the end of the world. You got all that? Mm -hmm. I said we have a dozen examples in the book of Acts of prayers that we are picking up on. I looked up the word derision because I wasn't sure of what it meant. And uh, if anybody else is wondering, please, please besides share. me, it was contemptuous ridicule or mockery. And they used the example, my stories were greeted with derision and disbelief uh, is the example. They kind of put it in a sentence. So Say, say the definition again, please. Contemptuous ridicule or mockery. All right. Oh. Now, who in the New Testament in the Gospels was greeted with derision? Christ. Yeah. He was greeted with with uh, with rejection and mockery. And what's the other word? Uh, um, uh, ridicule. 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 Yeah. Yeah, very appropriate, very appropriate. But the Lord hold, holds them in derision. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. So we have more to say here about this passage. Because Peter and John are the ones who are praying in answer to our first question. And what do they pray? First of all, here. They, they pray <laughs> that we know that Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the people of Israel gathered together against Jesus. They did. And so this is part of their talk, their sermon, if you will, their speech. Sometimes in the book of Acts, it's hard to determine whether it's a sermon or a speech. It's at least a speech. But you will find that the word yes. congregation is not, does not fit the context. It is, uh, I can't think of an example when it's not. It's a public speech with unbelievers uh, constituting a major part of the people who are listening. Especially as you get with Paul and Silas as they go about to various cities and they get arrested and then Paul makes his defense. These mostly are unbelievers who are listening to these speeches, which you could call sermons if you wanted to, but they're not in a church with a believer sitting there and a pastor up in front. So they, they, are, they are preaching and they are quoting Psalm 2. That's what they're praying. And they're praying to God. And sometimes people say in a prayer to God, we shouldn't tell him what he already knows. <laughs> In your prayer, you quoted the Bible so much, but why did you quote it to God? Because he wrote it. That's a funny way of saying it. But here's what you do. If you say to God, since you are the one who, and then you fill in that blank, we pray now. And you'll find that as a model for all the collects of the church, a short prayer that collects in the collect uh, the, the theme of the day. What I'm trying to say to you that in the beginning of a prayer, you are saying to God your confession of who he is and what he has done and what he has promised to do. 
your structure of your prayer can include a beginning of praise for the attributes or qualities of God or the promises of God upon which you are basing your faith and therefore your petition. For example, we're teaching how to pray by examples, and this is what I'm uh, saying here, is in your prayers to God, since you are ultimately the one who heals, although you do it through doctors and nurses and medicines and procedures, since you are the one who does all healing, we ask you now in the name of Jesus to be with, you understand my structure? And that's what Peter and John are praying. It's impossible for me to tell you that it's all Peter's prayer or, or John's prayer. They are, they are together, and the word they is used, it's plural. That's all I know. So Peter continues his prayer by saying to God what he has done. They did what you and your plan had predestined. Now he's doing a little bit of history. What happened in the closing chapters of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what's recorded there, about Jesus and his crucifixion and his resurrection. The enemies of Jesus did what you and your plan had predestined. So the prophets had to be fulfilled. In spite of their threats, here is his first petition. Grant boldness to speak your word. Their threats, we don't want you to preach in Jesus' name anymore. <clears throat> and that comes up again in Acts chapter 5. But they have already threatened them in Acts chapter 4. And that continues throughout the book of Acts, that the enemies of the message of Christ speak against the whoever is the, uh, the speaker, Peter, John, Paul, uh, and they tell them not to speak or else. So the prayer is always in spite of the fact that they are threatening us, grant us boldness not to be quiet about Jesus. Now tell me, is that something we could mm -hmm. or should pray mm -hmm. today? Yes. Yes, definitely. Why? We're in the same times. We are really? always going to be in these times when the enemies of God will speak against him and therefore against us. Do you want to speak with boldness or do you want to be like um, a timid little creature who crawls into the quiet darkness and doesn't say a word, don't want to get in trouble, don't want to offend anybody? What am I saying to you? What am I saying to us? I'm included in that. Yeah. We should, we should pray that we would speak with boldness, but I have to personally say that I often cowl away, unfortunately, um, in these times to, to be politically correct. To, uh, sometimes I, you know, because of the threat I feel personally. Well, I don't think you and I will be physically threatened, although it is coming closer in some of the cities. But the idea of uh, boldness, so you are about to talk to someone about Jesus in a way that will not be uh, an assault on them, but to give them something they don't have. Right. And when you witness about what he has done in your life, you can, in the middle of that, just have a little thought prayer that, Lord, I, I'm afraid to speak. I'm asking you to give me boldness. I said, um, Pastor, can I interject here? Because a lot of what you speak with boldness and other people feel you're attacking them. I mean, those non-believers, if they are of that mind and not open. Yeah, they might. But if you do it with gentleness and respect, yes. if you slow down, uh, the confession into a narrative of your own life, putting yeah. in what is true to you. They can never say to you what you believe isn't true. You can say, well, no, uh, I, I believe this with all my heart. And 
my prayer is going to be that you believe it too. But remember, there's a time to back off and a time to go ahead and speak. That requires the wisdom of God. So, anyone want to jump in here? I, you interrupt any time, and I'll try to pause. <laughs> I think uh, as I have moved into a new facility here where, um, you know, I'm surrounded by new people, um, I find it real important, you know, to be really sensitive and to, um, you know, it's going out to, I guess, become a friend, be a friend, and then uh, bring that friend to Christ to sort of find out where this person is coming from if an opportunity comes up um, that may open a door um, again, because, you know, like you said, you can, you can feel set aside and, um, you know, I, I have seen over the years how people will, they'll, they'll, they'll put you in that other group and won't include you or what have you. We all want to be included, um, naturally. And so we don't want to be set aside. And I think that's part of it is in that sensitivity is, is getting to know people sometimes even, um, with gentleness and love and through your actions, I think, and then through your, and then from there on, you can open your mouth probably more about sharing how Jesus has worked in your life or incidences that have occurred. Yes, you can say things like, I have found this to be true, mm -hmm. that whenever I am afraid, mm -hmm. I say a little prayer and I'm helped. Mm -hmm. No one can deny that. Yeah. Right. And, and I think too that your actions and you know, you can throw things in all the time but not be offensive. Correct. Right. So let's go on with the prayer uh, in which Peter and John say to God, stretch out your hand. If you study the Old Testament in the Greek translation, in the Greek translation, this phrase, stretch out your hand, is used 80 times. It is very common for the Old Testament writers to report that God stretched out his hand and saved his people. So that's what Peter and John are praying. They know the word of the Old Testament to use this phrase. So what are they asking God to do? to heal and to do signs and wonders through the name of Jesus. There's where the power is, not in the prayer, but in Jesus. That's what they're asking. So what was the result of their prayer? We have to go back and study it, don't we? Verse 31. And when they had prayed in the place. Verse 31 at the bottom. Okay. And what when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were gathered together and was shaken. Oh. And when they had prayed in the place where they were gathered together was shaken. And Earthquake. With the Holy Spirit. So it was shaken. Uh, is, that, is that Pentecost that they're referring to? No, no. That's nope. happening right then when they had prayed. Right then, okay. There was an earthquake. Remember when there was an earthquake before then? Mm. At the crucifixion. Yeah, right. Okay. Yes. And they were all filled with, they remembered that. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And did God answer their prayer? Yes. Um, I'm going to come back to here. The result, this earthquake, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Oh. Uh, spoke the word of God with boldness. Yes. When you study what Peter and John and what Paul later did, and um, I see we have a new visitor here. Uh, they were given the answer to that prayer. Okay. Now, there's a situation in Acts chapter 6 that we want to uh, read about and then to see what the problem was and why they prayed and who prayed and what was the result, okay? So would someone please read Acts 6, 1 through 13? We want to welcome someone into our room. 
Yeah, I, Patty, I, oh, oh, D, D is here. Yeah, D he is here. I didn't recognize I, it. Joanne, did you want to read, please? I can read. Okay. Now, in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we all will appoint to this duty. You know, when you read the book of Acts and you read about the Hellenists, you, <laughs> you might be, who are they? Very easy answer to that. They were the Greek-speaking Jews. You know that some of the Jews had gone away from Judea into other lands. It was called the dispersion. They were dispersed. Okay. I can't say when, some early, some late, but they were not living in their home country but they began to speak what was the common language of the Mediterranean world. And they were what I'm calling Greek speaking Jews. These were called the Hellenists. It is very difficult for me to put on the white word that I don't have how the word Hellenists came to mean that. I can do that another time. Just uh, please uh, for this morning's sake, uh, take my, word and my explanation. So they were complaining because they weren't getting the distribution. What was the distribution? I think some of you remember. Um, anybody remember what the distribution was? Was it food? Food. It food. Yeah, food. Who took care uh, of the Social Security uh, Administration in the first century? Uh, well, we didn't, I guess it was the early church, the early believers. That's right. You see, when you give an offering to the church, it's going into a fund. The fund was dispersed. And in our case, we, the, the food would be bought. I suppose in that case, they were bringing food, but I'm not, I don't know. And the, um, the New Testament doesn't say how it is administered, but Anyway, they were being neglected in the daily distribution, and that's not right. The, the 12 apostles were willing to do the distribution, but we were appointed by the Lord Jesus to preach the word of God. It's not right that we should give this up. So here's a suggestion. Pick out uh, seven men, and here is the requirement that they be of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and wisdom, and we'll appoint them. So that's the problem which gives rise uh, to the prayer which is at the end of this section that we'll read now. Uh, Joanne, this, since you started it, I'll ask you, if you will, to finish this. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And what they said pleased the whole gathering, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. Okay, and there's the prayer at the end. So they chose seven, and what happens is that the apostles said, we're going to devote ourselves to what we were called and installed and ordained to do. I'm using present-day terms, but that's what the Lord Jesus had appointed them to do to this ministry of prayer and the ministry of the word. 
There are loads of applications of this to today's church. I'm going to muzzle myself <laughs> and not say a whole lot about that. Let's stay here in the New Testament. What they say said, well, that's a good idea. It was consensus. And uh, they chose these seven men. Two of them come up later in the book of Acts. Stephen and Philip, very soon. The other five, I don't believe maybe one of them is mentioned and then you never hear from them. So they prayed and they laid their hands on them. It is the custom of the Old Testament and also the New to do this when someone is being installed or placed into an office of responsibility. The responsibility is to the Lord, ultimately, and to the people who are doing the installing and, and putting someone into an office. You'll find this uh, also happening when uh, pastors are installed, when you read 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. They prayed and they laid their hands on them. The prayer is for them to carry out the work to which they have been appointed. And when you go to church and you see pastor up there and he calls the members of a group up in front of him, it could be the teachers, it could be uh, someone who has recently called, it could be the board of directors, it could be the board of elders. And he calls them up in front of you in the congregation and he goes through a little two or three minute ceremony, and he puts uh, them into that office, uh, and he's doing that publicly for your sake and for the benefit of the, of the whole congregation. Now, the brief word I'm going to say about devoting ourselves to prayer and ministry of the word and have these uh, seven do the work of what we now call deacons, and a deacon is, is a word who, who is a servant of the church. Okay, in the New Testament, it becomes an office. Well, they carry this out so that the apostles do what they've been called to do. And what I'm saying briefly is if you look at the call document for a pastor, I have one in my file for my current call. And it's the same 11 things that were on my call when I first went into the ministry. Those 11 things have not changed. Uh, the call document that we get, that puts our name, someone puts our name on it and it's signed and when then we're installed and it, or, we're, we're there, you know. And those are the 11 things that we're called to do. And every pastor should occasionally pull out that call document from the file and and read it and find out what he's supposed to be doing. <laughs> and not do the things that he's not called to do. I hope you will always get my point and not in a harsh way, not a critical way, because so many times in my ministry, I confess my, to my shame that I majored in minors. I, th I think your, your I or comment is taken in that churches can get off the path just like we as people sinners get off the path and need to be directed back onto the path uh, of what we're supposed to be doing. We get uh, and the pastors are we get sidetracked. Go ahead. And the pastor's not supposed to be doing everything. Yeah, we can't. But some pastors try, and they, they kill themselves quite literally. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I know that it was kind of fun to do other things. <laughs> but every once in a while, someone should tap me on the shoulder or tap you, uh, another pastor on the shoulder and say, you know what, you weren't called to do that. Now, there doesn't mean that I, I, I wasn't called to move tables and chairs, but every pastor knows that he spends a third of his time moving chairs and tables in the church. I'm exaggerating people, but <laughs> we were never trained in seminary to move chairs and tables. 
but it has to be done because a meeting's going to happen in about 20 minutes. Well, that's people who come uh, do that. Why don't you pray about what's going to happen in the meeting? You can have these little conversations. Now, I'm going to spend any more time on it because it's not useful to you, and I don't mean it as a harangue against anybody or anything, but it's just to, to center the church about what God has called the church to do and to center the pastor to, to do what he is called to do. And, the, and all the, and the board and the deacons. Everything, yes. Get out your job description. Now, what happened as a result? Oh, uh, here, I asked another question. Uh, upon what principal works did the apostles want to concentrate their ministry? Prayer. And their and calling. Prayer and what? Um, teaching. Teaching yes. and salvation. Prayer and the ministry of the word. That's preaching and teaching. And mm -hmm. also individual instruction uh, as the occasion arises. So you are correct. Prayer in the ministry of the word. After they had chosen seven men, what was their prayer? It's like a quiz, isn't it? That they have wisdom to do their duty. That certainly would have been included. What was their prayer? Sorry, time's up to set those men apart for this diaconal service. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I said diaconal, just to use the word that is in the original. It is the service as deacons. But when they set these people apart, they weren't officially establishing the office of deacon, although it was a beginning of it. I don't know if that makes sense to you. Okay, you know that some denominations, such as the Baptist, they do have the office of the deacon active in the congregation. We also have deaconesses. We have women who are in that office, and they are trained at Valparaiso and at St. Louis at that seminary and at Fort Wayne at that seminary. Mm -hmm. So we have deaconesses. You know that pastor's wife, Martha, is a deaconess, don't you? Yes. Okay. Do they have a deaconess up there in Erie, Pennsylvania? Um, no. no. They may at, I don't belong to the Missouri Synod Church up here. I belong to the ELCA. Okay. So they may, because I think Frank was a deacon at the church that they attended up here. Okay. So certainly it's fine if you if you have that office. I think Faith Lutheran has a gal up there that's, I, I think she's still up there. That's a yes. difference. At last I knew, yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think they have one, uh, a deaconess at St. Paul. No, I, I think they have two vicars down there right now. Two? I, th mm -hmm. I, I thought I heard possibly two, yes. They have an assistant pastor. They have an assistant pastor, and they have, I know, one vicar for sure, and I'm not sure if they have two, and then they have their senior pastor. This time of the year, sometimes they overlap. One is finishing up and one is starting, depending mm -hmm. on what dates they choose. I don't know. So let's go on. Prayers in the book of Acts, the result, there are three results in verse 7, which we didn't read because I didn't put it there. Okay. Here are the results of their prayer. And the word of God continued to increase. That was the, the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And yeah. a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. That is just a wonderful outlook. As when, when the ministry of the word and prayer was carried on by the twelve. That that's all they did. And so as a result of that concentration on their ministry, which was, was given to them, the word of God continued to increase. Now, that doesn't mean there were many books of the Bible added. That's not what that means. It means that it continued to be preached to more and more people. Multiplied. Yes, the number of disciples multiplied. Mm -hmm. But if you read the book of Acts... 
and you'll catch it if you read it rather rapidly, you will find that seven times St. Luke appears to end uh, a section, not a chapter. The chapters weren't written at that time. But he ends like a section with this concluding paragraph, with concluding sentence or phrase that the word of God increased or the word of God multiplied or the church was built up. And it's as if Luke is saying to the world that will read his 28 chapter book that as a result of the word of the Lord being preached and taught the word of Jesus crucified and risen the church was growing if you want to go to a special university in California and learn all about you get your doctor's degree in church growth you can go out there or you can read the book of Acts <laughs> I am oversimplified. What I'm saying to you, the church growth principles, if you want to read about them, they're all here in the New Testament. And the, the greatest one here is, is in the book of Acts as we see how the church grew. And we've already read three of the principal passages about that. What's surprising to you, I think, and to me, a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. <clears throat> you knew, you knew, didn't you, that the early church was largely Jewish? Yeah. But then things I mean, happened. Those Jews didn't stop believing, but it became more and more difficult to bring them into fellowship. Can you explain that more? Uh, the the priests and and the early church being Jewish people. I mean, I know that because that's who, where they were. But I don't get what this says now. What you just said. The Book of Acts is largely conversion of the Jews into believing in Jesus as the Messiah that was promised by the prophets. So Messianic Jewish in a way. We would. That's what we call them today. Yes. Now, beginning with Acts chapter ten. When Peter is told, uh, we'll get to that here uh, next week probably, uh, that Peter is, is told, go see Cornelius. And Cornelius is not a Jew. And Peter objects to going to Cornelius because the, the, the Gentiles are unclean. I'm not going to do that. And he gets a vision and God says, yes, uh, don't call Clean, unclean what God has called clean. Mm -hmm. So that, that there's, a, there's like a switch is turned on in Acts chapter 10 when the Gentiles become the principal uh, part of the growth of the church. The non-Jews, the Gentiles. Now, now the priests, were the priests and the Pharisees the same or is, there, is that no. two? No. no. Okay. Yeah. I hear a Pharisees yes and I hear a no. The Pharisees and the Sadducees continued to set themselves apart. They did, okay. Didn't say that none believed. I can't say that. So but, were the priests similar to like the apostles probably in the Jewish um, church? You, we began to study the priests back when we were studying Eli, the priest. Mm -hmm. the, the priest in the Old Testament were the ones to right. whom the sacrifice uh, who made the sacrifices in the temple okay, and uh, that the whole priesthood is a huge study in the Old Testament but they were the Levites they were the ministers the Levites Levi. okay. what, what is the rule not all not all Levites are priests but all priests are Levites you okay okay <laughs> I'm, I'm going um, I'm going briefly here so I would think converted. probably as 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 the Jewish people were converting over, <laughs> they were losing their congregations and hearing this over and over. I would, that would be a common thing. The priests, as they became obedient to the faith. All right. Go to uh, go in your minds at least. Uh, not look it up now, 
but go in your minds to Luke chapter one, when Zacharias is, a, he gets to serve his turn. He is selected uh, to go that uh, time into the temple and be a priest. And then he has this vision and told about his, the son is going to be born of his wife, Elizabeth, who was barren and he doesn't believe it. And he's made to be mute for it's, nine yeah. months until the baby is born. And then it's John the Baptist that is born of his wife. And now we get the ball rolling in the New Testament because he grows up and, and proclaims the way of the Lord. Well, Zacharias is a priest serving his turn. Okay. okay. We have so many of them that not everyone goes in every day, you see. And some, only the high priest goes in on the high holy day, the day of atonement. Or they they say it all in one sentence. But those are the priests. That's what they are doing. And many of them who have their heart and mind in the Old Testament, and when they see that Jesus fulfills the prophecies that they know very well, because they've studied them, mm -hmm. then they they come to faith so so that's what that's the answer of the word priest in number three they were the uh levite priest who uh monitored the sacrifices yes and other duties of the temple yeah i'm yeah, looking at my uh, clock and i try to keep this at 50 minutes so we're going to see if it's if we can go on. I don't think so. Well, let's look at it. There was in Joppa a disciple named Tabitha, which translated means Dorcas. Tabitha is her Hebrew name, and Dorcas is the translation into Greek. Anybody know what Dorcas means? Dorcas. Here's the hint. It's an animal. Oh, it's an animal? Mm -hmm. Donkey, and you can see it at many zoos. Hmm. I thought Dorcas was like a um, a provider and giver to the poor. She is, and that's in the rest of the sentence. But her name means gazelle. Hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. A beautiful animal. Because you hear Dorcas circles are very common in the church. And that's because she is their example, full of good works and acts of charity. Mm -hmm. okay. Goes on. Okay. Well, she became ill and died. And when they had washed her, they laid her in an upper room, which was the custom in that day. Since Lydia, since Lydda, Lydda, was near Joppa, the disciples, hearing that Peter was there, sent two men to him, urging him, please come to us without delay. So Peter rose and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the upper room. All the widows stood beside him, weeping and showing tunics and other garments that Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all outside and knelt down and prayed. And turning to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up and he gave her his hand and raised her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he presented her alive. And it became known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. So he prayed for healing, for a resurrection. That is a great miracle. It doesn't happen every day. All he does is say, Tabitha, arise. The apostles were given special powers. They did not pass this on in that same sense to those that followed them. There are no more apostles after the close of the New Testament. All right. So there are 12 and then Paul and some say, I think in one place, Apollos. But we're not sure about that. But what was the result in this healing? Oh. Verse 42. Well, Dorcas was made alive and many believed in the Lord. The purpose of the miracles of the book of Acts is to show the authority 
of the apostles and to make the word of the Lord grow and to bring people to faith. All right. I think that's where we have to close today. We didn't get very far, did we? I think we did. I, th I think I think we did. It, it, you know, it's funny uh, about the priest. I don't know somewhere we've talked about priests on an individual basis, but I just never saw it in that overall manner in which we just talked about. Right. Yeah, this is a good place to end today. And I want you to continue to study the book of Acts on your own. Oh, by the way, the, the people who drew this picture, the person who drew this picture, see, this is, this is all her quilts. Gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, they're, they're the garments and the tunics that she, that she made. What a wonderful ministry she had. Um, you all have skills and abilities. Some of you can, are better at listening and a few of us are better at talking. And uh, I want to ask you to um, let the Lord use your eyes uh, to see the needs and let him use your heart in a compassionate way to respond to those needs, including need to prayer. And uh, let him use your feet and your hands uh, and your skills and uh, abilities and your resources, both financial and otherwise. Let him use those um, today. And and uh, tomorrow, if you get it. And uh, we'll give praise and thanks to the Lord today because he has made us alive in Christ and given us the Holy Spirit. And with faith in his promises, we'll just keep on praying for the things that uh, we need and to praise him. Thank you, Lord, for the ministry of the word and prayer which give to us what we need for the teachers in your church who have dedicated themselves to telling about Jesus. Grant, O oh Lord, that our ears may hear, our minds understand, and our hearts believe what you have said so that we respond in faith to all the things that you want us to do in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.